beautiful, Hannah. That was great. Thank you. <laughs> Before we even get into your introduction, what tuning were you using there? Dadgad. Okay. Yeah, that, that was my first like dive into alternate tuning, and then I just was like, yeah, standard, I'll dip into that every now and then, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, very nice voicings that you had on there. Thank you, thank you. Well, for anybody who doesn't know, if you haven't <laughs> caught any of Hannah's videos before, this is Hannah Evelyn, uh, singer, songwriter, artist here in the tri-state area, and also we are fortunate to have her as a part of the Moore team. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Which we all love. Well, let's find out a little bit about you. For one thing, I, I, I'm going to dig into your music a little bit first mm -hmm. because um, if you haven't checked out any of Hannah's work, her, her videos or her recordings, the albums that she's put out, I love her songs. Very interesting take on the singer-songwriter. It, it, your, your stuff just blows me away whenever I hear it. These are just like such a blush fest, so <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but yeah, I've told you, whenever you did the, the video over here and the first time I got yeah. to hear you with the trio, I was just like, oh my gosh, those, the songs were just incredible. Thank you, yeah, I really, I, I take a lot of pride in my songwriting and I, it's kind of funny because a lot of people, I think when we talk about uh, every day, we find people bringing themselves into the guitar world for the first time. And uh, a lot of people say, well, I had a guitar idol. I had this person who wanted to bring me into playing guitar. And for me, guitar was like just the means to an end. I had all these songs that I had written and I had no accompaniment. <laughs> and I, wow. I had started playing piano and it was fine and it, you know, I could write some things and it made sense, but uh, guitar was really just the vehicle to like get out all of the songs that I was writing at such a young age. So it's, yeah, guitar found me. I <laughs> That's very cool. Yeah. <laughs> so the, I guess what I'm taking from that is that you didn't in particular have a guitarist that you were trying to emulate. It Not was at all. just... Yeah. You wanted, you needed something as an accompaniment. I, I mean, I fell in love with like a bunch of bands and like I loved music at the time, but I really just wanted to write music. I wrote a bunch of poetry and all these things that uh, felt musical. And uh, so, yeah, it was the desire to write songs that brought me to how, okay, how do I play them? <laughs> mm -hmm. How do I actually like make arrangements and, and fill them out besides just the, the vocals, you know, of that process, so, yeah. Do you see any influences that are on your songwriting? Yeah, now that I, like, look back on it, uh, I was super into Paramore, and I'm still into Paramore, so a lot of their songwriting, uh, and then now as I've gotten older, looking more to like Laura Marling or like Nico Case and uh, some of these more independent kind of Americana singer-songwriter uh, women. In, uh, and so I, I see a lot of myself in a lot of different things, but it's, it's funny how those kind of seeped in from the sides and it was never like this apparent thing of trying to emulate. Um, yeah. I, I was really interested because I've really never talked to you about yeah. that. And <laughs> From listening to your stuff, I could never pinpoint where your starting point was because it all sounded very fresh and very original. Thank you. I, yeah, I, I was lucky enough to be introduced to a whole variety and different genres of music from uh, my dad and my mom. And my dad in particular, uh, he ran sound for uh, a, a bunch of bands and was on tour. My favorite story to tell about him is uh, that he got to tour with the Dix Dixie Chicks on their first tour and was there when Wide Open Spaces dropped. Wow. And got to see them like get into their new, their fresh RV or their actual tour bus and out of the RV. Um, so it got, it got a wide variety of influences really young, which I think is why it's kind of hard to pin down sometimes yeah. of what I do. Uh, I've had people compare me to, you know, Stevie Nicks and Radiohead in the same sentence. <laughs> 
and <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Musically, it's from what I hear, your songs musically and the chord structure, you've got a lot more going on than what most people associate with a singer-songwriter kind yeah, of thing. I appreciate that. And I, that's one of the things that really drew me to it so much because you got a lot going on. Mm -hmm. The melodies are so well developed and then just the, the topics of the songs. Where do, where do you draw most of your lyrics from? What are the, what are the stories? Um, I, all sorts of places, you know, as an artist of many mediums, I feel like they all kind of feed each other. So sometimes I'll uh, make a painting that's, you know, developing something that I've been thinking through and I'll write a song based off of a painting or I'll write some poetry and I'll paint off of the, those sets of poems. So I have this very kind of like intermedia type of inspiration that I work from and it, you know, you always get that question when you do so many different disciplines. It's like, but if you only had to pick one, what would it be? And I was like, no, they all no. like <laughs> <laughs> they all feed each other and they all grow from each other. So I, you know, I, I pull from my own personal experience. I really love telling other people's stories as well. Um, I try not to tell stories that I don't have um, some sort of like emotional connection to or empathy for because I want to make sure that you know, they all come from a place of, of me feeling and me being that sponge and that filter for, uh, for this thing we call life, so. <laughs> and since you, you bring that up, I mean, Hannah's also a, an artist as, and from, you know, sketching, painting, and I'm not even sure all the mediums you work in. I me love either. the paintings <laughs> you're, you've, that I've seen. Yeah. But I guess that explains a little bit to me because when you've got just not a story, but you've got imagery mm -hmm. that's inspiring you as well. That's yeah. going to lead you in a little bit different direction, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. The visuals are um, so powerful to me, and the words that correspond to those things are always, they always feel very necessary. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I love the way these things cross over, and um, my, my background is uh, coming from a place where I, my, my degree is in fine art. So really trying to evaluate and critique your own work and be able to pull from uh, what's working and what's not, uh, that goes across everything. Songwriting, painting, printmaking, drawing, whatever I decide to come up with next. Like, um, they, they're really all necessary to be able to evaluate your work and, and understand and break down where everything's coming from. So yeah, it all crosses over. <laughs> Amazing. Um, how old were you when you started your performance? So I, the time I started playing to the time I started performing was very quick. Uh, I picked up the guitar, I think around like 12 and, um, I started playing like little coffee shops and performing at school and other things like that at like 13. So, <laughs> <laughs> That's great. yeah, so I, and, and right now I'm, I'm currently 24, so it's, I, I grew up going to more music and meeting all of Ed and Corey and all these people. Um, while I was in this journey of coming to songwriting, coming to guitar, and uh, having those people around me to help was always such a great gift that I value and I'm really grateful to be here and a part of that team now. So it's, yeah, it, when you start off so young and you continue to form different bands and, you know, go off on your journey, uh, having that like place to start and go back to always feels really good. So. And you have had the opportunity, I mean, to really develop a lot of maturity and you've done you. a lot of things at this point that, you know, other musicians your age are just <laughs> getting a start. You know? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, like I said, having a, a set of parents who were very like encouraging. Yeah, they might not have known everything, <laughs> but encouraging you to go out and you know play open mics and coffee shops and things like that uh, is is really a, a gift. So now uh, at 24, being able to say I've had a couple bands behind me, hopefully a couple more bands in front of me, and uh, loving the projects I'm doing right now. Uh, got to put out a couple records, got to go down to South by Southwest one year. Um, so 
yeah, all of these really wonderful opportunities that I, I, I would hope that everybody gets to experience, you know? Uh, well, you've, you've had it quite fortunate, but, you know, well-deserved, too. Thank you. <laughs> this a talented young lady here. Thank you. um, I wanted to ask, there's, in our marketing last year, and I'm sure, you know, every company's been through this, it's, you know, the, the impact of women and bringing mm -hmm. women into music, yeah. especially into guitar. Yes. And it almost seems like it's some kind of underground phenomenon that none of us can see because there are so many good and talented young artists that are coming up. Yeah. You know, women who are playing guitar, writing songs, and the only place you see them is on stage. It's like, you know, we, we wonder where, where are they? <laughs> Getting everything. We keep our secrets so close, <laughs> yes. you'll never know. No, we find a we find a really rich community in each other, and we seek each other out for sure. I uh, I, th I was just telling you before we started filming, I'm getting to do a really great show uh, at your brother's bookstore here in Evansville um, with uh, Lori Andrick, who goes by Laura Lai, and then uh, Samantha Michelle, uh, both of whom are wonderful guitar players, wonderful songwriters. And yeah, it's, it is hard to find community and, and find those things, but we, we seek it out in each other. And uh, I think a lot of women start where I did from a stance of the songwriting perspective, mm -hmm. because there are so few women guitar heroes that get propped up uh, unless you know where to look in the, you know, uh, you know, the hearts of the, uh, <laughs> the world right. and, you know, things like that. Um, I think a lot of us come to it from a songwriting perspective or just uh, a storytelling uh, background. So at least all of the wonderful you know, women in music that I've been able to meet, a lot of us are drawn to that, I think. As far as you know, for a, a retail experience, do you still feel that there's a, a sense or a belief out there that it's still kind of a boys club when you walk into a guitar store? Oh yeah, I mean, I. Uh, we talk about this a lot on the team, especially making sure that I feel comfortable, but also me as an educator to them as well, of uh, sharing our experiences and what we what we face on the sales floor. And um, I get asked if I play guitar <laughs> every <laughs> single day. <laughs> and whereas, you know, sometimes the guys will get it up there. But uh, yeah, for me, it's like a daily occurrence. So uh, definitely from a customer standpoint, I think there's a misconception, but I also think there's a misconception about who walks in. I have so many women and uh, people across the gender spectrum who walk in and want to know more about the process and want insight from, you know, outside of the forums and you know mm -hmm. things like that and want to talk to a real person. So there's there's a bit of a misconception from quite a few people, but there's also a misconception about who's walking through the doors because it's everybody. Everybody's walking in, and. Yeah, we're we're here to help. Gotcha. Well, I know we're we're all so glad to have you as part of this here. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the guitar that we just heard here. What do you? Have? Yeah. So uh, this is kind of a, a, a weird one. This is a Martin. This is a JC16 Aura. So it's basically a D28. It's got rosewood back and sides, and then an aged uh, spruce top. Um, but it's a little bit thinner. Uh, it's it's not as deep in the body, mm -hmm. and then of course it has the Fishman Aura system in here, which is really wonderful for uh, a stage performance guitar. And this thing is beat to hell. <laughs> like it. Yeah, it it sounds gorgeous. I mean, in the room, the sound just filled it up, and yeah. it sounds very good. You know, through our Fishman amp over here. And, yeah. yeah. This is definitely my like inspiration starting point for so much of what I do, uh, as even though. Pretty much all of my projects now are electric guitar based. Almost all of my songwriting starts exclusively on this piece. Um, it, it, it's not my first acoustic, but it's definitely one of the first acoustics that I just latched onto and it felt like an extension of myself. So this is a really special guitar. It has probably like little to no value, honestly, at this point because it's like cracked binding and there's all sorts of Buckle, you know, buckle rash back here, but um, I'll just call it relict when I yes, sell it. There you go. So. <laughs>
but yeah, it's been played and loved, and uh, yeah, it's a really special piece to me. Well, when you bought your first guitar, mm -hmm. how did you, who guided you to that, and how did you, how did you come to make that match with your first guitar? So my first guitar was actually not purchased by me. It was my grandmother's guitar, and uh, it was just an old Yamaha. Um, I, I'm pretty sure it was like. Uh, not even like all solid wood. It was, you know, just laminate mahogany back and sides. And uh, so that's what I first started learning on. When I first purchased a guitar, um, that was a, a more music experience. And I don't even remember what was my first purchase because to me, like my first guitar, my first real guitar was my grandmother's guitar. Uh -huh. Yeah. Ed has told the story about when he first met you at more guitar. Really? Is that an experience that he... <laughs> I don't... What did he say? Well, I, he was like, that. you came in here and I think you had your softball uniform on. Oh, and my gosh. you come from a softball practice. So or? that's probably a compilation of many times that uh, I walked into okay. more music because uh, I played travel softball and was on the school teams and stuff for so long. And so uh, I had this double life where I was this creative, artistic soul, but also a complete jock. <laughs> and they crowded, they butted heads all the time. But um, yeah, I, I used to walk in like fresh off of practice and be like, hi, Ed, I know I'm sweaty and kind of grubby from the field, but can I play this guitar? <laughs> <laughs> oh, the cringy things that we love to look back on. I'm so oh, glad he remembers that, oh, yes. Edward Sign. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's exceptional. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, let's... Uh, I want to hear a little bit about this very cool electric yeah. that you brought in as well. And uh, while we're doing, I'll uh, here I'll kind of right, spin, I'll... and I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah. Uh, so this guitar, this is my uh, Reverend Club King 290. This uh, very obviously it has two P90 pickups and a Bigsby on it. Um, Semi hollow with a roasted maple neck. So this thing is like my workhorse, for sure. It is such a gorgeous guitar. Yeah. Is was that one that came from Moore? Yes. When we were still selling mm -hmm. Reverend guitars, this came from Moore, um, and I think this was like the last guitar I bought before I started working here. <laughs> oh, so yeah, it's seen me through a lot. My case has like stickers from every single place that I've been and all the friends that I've met along the way. And so, yeah, this guitar definitely has stories. And again, a bunch of like dings and <laughs> kind of like little small things that kind of make it uh, just it's mine. character. Yeah, yeah that's what yeah. you got to do to make them yours. If yeah. you're not playing them, why? <laughs> so what was it that led you to a guitar like this? So I had been a telly player for a really long time, and I still am. I still have uh, my little like Mexican Telecaster that I have at home. Uh, but I wanted something with a, a bit more punch, but still single coils, which of course is what everybody <laughs> like loves about B90s. Um, and I just really fell in love with with the pickups. So, and then the Bigsby was just, I mean. Does anybody not like a Bigsby? They're so cool. Like, <laughs> you can't tell me there's a cooler looking like tremolo system out there. There is not a cooler one. And yeah. if, I could, if I could get a decal and put it on my guitar, I'd have it. I don't want to mess with it mechanically. <laughs> I, okay, that's It's just fair. a taste thing, you yeah. know? But yeah, they are extremely cool yes. looking. At first I thought you were going to say a decal to like tattoo <laughs> on your leg or something. <laughs> I'm Bigsby. <laughs> Bigsby ready. But yeah, this thing, it sounds awesome. I usually have it on the neck pickup uh, just to get some warmth out of it. is a great sound. It really has a vintage quality to it. I mean, I'm yeah. hearing something from way back. <laughs> yeah. It definitely does, but with the locking tuners and bass roll off, <laughs> like modern accompaniments that I prefer. So yeah, very, very nice. 
Yeah. And which model is this? So this is the Reverend Club King 290. Um, yeah, like I said, the, the 290 just indicates the uh, two P90 pickups and, uh, and the Bixby. Yeah. 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 Super, super nice. Yeah, I love this piece. So single coil, you, you played Kelly before this, obviously. Mm -hmm. So I know that you've also had a love for the Fender offsets. Yes. I'm, I hear you talking about You showed them off at the staff meetings. I may or may not so. continually ask for more offsets to be purchased and put in the building. <laughs> so they if you see a cool, Jazz Master, it's probably my fault. Yeah, um, I, yeah I, that's definitely my one piece that I don't have in my arsenal of guitars. I've got uh, some Filtertrons, I've got P90s, single coils. I've got kind of everything in that realm uh, besides gold foils and like P100. My birthday's in July, by the way. So if <laughs> You still got your eye on that gold foil out there? I kind of do. That is a cool guitar. I love that guitar, yeah. So how do you help guide someone to the sound that they're looking for when they're talking to you about guitar? I think people tend to not trust themselves as much as they should during that process. Is It's really a lot easier of a question than we make it out to be. It's, what are you listening to? What's inspiring you? What are they playing? <laughs> is like what it comes down to. So, um, you know, filtering out those questions when people come in is uh, always a really great place to start. And then from there, again, that process of trusting yourself of what feels good, what feels good in your hands and what's gonna inspire you to play more. See, they just like play themselves. They do. Once you find the right one. And, uh, yeah, if, like I said with my Martin, is if it feels like an extension of yourself. Um, I am kind of odd in a lot of the guitar players that I've met of, I buy a guitar for its entirety. I have to like how it looks, how it plays, how it sounds, how it feels. I have to like every single aspect of it. I won't buy it just to change the pickups. <laughs> that, that's quite fair. Yeah, um, yeah. so um, for me it's, you know, and not everybody is like that in the guitar buying process, but especially when people aren't sure what they want, um, just that process of encouraging them to trust themselves and know that even if you're, you can't quite articulate what you want, you still know what you want. Your ears have as much, you know, experience as my ears. It's just that I have the vocabulary to help you kind of nail down what's going on, so. Do you ever find that when a person comes in and you, you ask them those kind of qualifying questions mm -hmm. and they end up with a guitar that's totally different than they thought they wanted when they first started talking to you? That does happen. And I think, you know, a couple things can happen. Like if, you're, if your eyes are making the decision, that's okay. <laughs> I, uh, we often tell people like if you walk by the guitar and you can't pick it up without like just wanting to play it, then that's the guitar for you, you know? So uh, sometimes people make that decision, which is still correct. And then other times I think um, we have misconceptions of what a guitar can sound like. We just exactly. talked about this earlier of how many early country records were on a Les Paul. Mm -hmm. So, just, you know, we, we have to kind of break down some of those stereotypes that we all kind of have about certain guitars and where they fit and um, what genres they can only do. The truth is, it's going to put out what you put into it <laughs> to a certain extent. They're I all flexible. That is such a great way to sum it up. Yeah. Um, and I think, hopefully, things have changed a little bit with everyone having more access to the Internet. There being more information out about mm -hmm guitars that were used on songs. I just know yeah. back when I was a young guitar buyer and I went into a store and said, I want to sound like Jimmy Page. If somebody handed me a Telecaster, I would have walked out not realizing that he, that's what he was using on his early yeah. albums, you know, yeah. his early Zeppelin albums. Mm -hmm. um, and now, yeah, I mean, you if, you if you find a guitar that does speak to you, that you want to play, to me it's always been about feel. Whenever I put it in my hand and I'm just going, oh, yeah. It's yeah. like, 
I'll change all the electronics in it. I'll put. <laughs> I'll, I'll replace all yes. the hardware just so I can have that feel. That feel. That's yeah. that's always was important to me. Yeah, it's totally like there are multiple ways to get to the right answer. I yeah, <laughs> yeah the the guitar world is so flexible and so able to be catered to whatever you're trying to go for. Whenever you're trying to help someone who is filling in like a slot in their guitar arsenal mm -hmm. that they've already got you know maybe a guitar maybe a couple of guitars yeah how rather than just you know collecting them like you know bubblegum cards or something how do you how do you help a person figure out what slots into you know what they're looking for what they might be missing in their toolbox yeah i think it you know there's those sonic kind of gaps, but then, like you said, there's those feel gaps, too, where it's like... Another tour will come through in 15 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> it's like Disneyland here, what can we say? <laughs> Larry dresses up like a mouse every now and then. <laughs> yeah, that's all but, these. Yeah, there's, uh, there's different sonic gaps that somebody might be needing to fill, and then there's different, like, feel gaps. Um, I think when it comes to opening people's perspective to different features that they might be stuck on. Uh, if it's maybe something as simple as trying a different fretboard radius or trying uh, a different finish, um, things like that can just alter the way that you play and the way that uh, what you're wanting kind of comes out of you. So I, I think, yeah, when trying to fill those different areas of need and maybe you're not always sure what that need is, um, being open to experiencing new features of, uh, of guitars that you might not have tried otherwise or you've kind of closed your mind off to. Yeah, yeah that's great. Well, just a little bit about you and the Moore team here. Um, how long have you been here? Five years, she said tentatively. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, so, let's see. I think I started in 20, yeah, 2018. Yep. So, five years, she said more confidently. That's great. That's great. <laughs> well, I'm sure that, that you could be selling guitars just about anywhere that you wanted to be. What is it that you find that's special about the people you work with here? I, yeah, it's, it's the things that have nothing to do with guitar. <laughs> Ed and I uh, will have wonderful conversations about all sorts of uh, different things that are on our mind um, that help us be better people and uh, sometimes product will get put into that to be better salespeople. But um, Corey and I will also get to have so many varied discussions about music and uh, his experience here in the scene as a working musician for so long. and. Uh, advice I mean there's there's so many things about like the dynamic of us as a team and as people and friends that uh, I think gets transferred to the experience of like walking in here too so we know that the the better we are at working together customers will see that um, and it's just kind of a byproduct of uh, us having a lot of respect for each other and, and a deeper friendship that goes beyond guitars so yeah, that that's great. Hopefully, hopefully for anybody who's been in the store, that that does show because I see that y'all have a the same kind of respect for the customers, yeah. which is one of the things that I don't find at a lot of stores. Yeah, I mean, we. I think it comes with the knowledge that we've all had bad experiences in in retail settings, period, uh, but in guitar shops where. You know, I walked into uh, a pretty notable music store and was completely ignored, whereas my dad asked if he could take something down for me, and the guy hands it to him, and he's like, it's not for me, it's for her. So, you know, we've, we've all had those experiences, so we know what it's like. We don't want to perpetuate that, but we also, you know, we have, we have the respect for everybody to walking in that we don't know where you're coming from. We don't know your background. We don't know anything about you until we establish that relationship with you and get to talking with you. So I, I think we all have um, that understanding that, you know, we're going to meet you where you're at. We just have to find where you're at and, uh, yeah, get to establish that connection. That is great. 
Now, Hannah, we are so glad to have you here. I'm so glad I get to work with you. you yes. Just, you make me smile every time I get a chance to spend some time with you. The feeling is mutual. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. And yet, yeah, this is another reason why more should be your store. We've got people like Hannah. You've met everybody. Um, we've got one left to go, I've, I have to say. You're going to get to meet Scott in one of the next videos that we do. Uh, the most knowledgeable sales team that I've ever been around. They are experts on every product they sell. And come and visit. Yeah. Hannah wants to see you, right? I do, yes. Yeah. <laughs>